वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला दिस इज योर मॉड्यूल ऑन सिलेक्टेड पोएम्स ऑफ ऑल स्टीवेंट्स आई एम शोरमिला मजुमदार एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कल्याणी वेस्ट बेंगाल वॉल स्टीवेंट्स इज वन ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट मॉडर्निस्ट पोएट्स ऑफ अमेरिका This module will discuss Wallace Stevens's poetic genius with critical reading of two of his poems The Emperor of Ice Cream and A High-Toned Old Christian Woman from his first collection of poetry titled Harmonium which was published in 1923 Well before uh, we start talking about it uh, I would like to tell a few words about Stevens himself. He was a insurance banker by profession and came to writing and publishing poetry quite late in life. Uh, most of his major works um, uh, were written when he was post 50. So he is one of those rare phenomena phenomena in literature where genius flowers so late in life stevens is the register of the tension between two extremes in american imagination a sense of the religious mythic and organic past and a sense of the technological scientific future fraught with the weight of infinite advance stevens remains the invaluable poet of the present moment poised between nostalgia and expectation there are uh, several things in stevens's poetry which we may enumerate one by one the first being duality and ambivalence is intrinsic to all stevens's life and his creation He was a lawyer as well as a poet. His poetry tussled between romantic imagery and modernist train. His philosophy engages with the duality between consciousness and the outer world, between imagination and reality, between words and the world. Imagination and reality in Stevens's poetic thought considers imagination is the most potent creative force. but imagination must adhere to reality so you see there is a two way traffic between reality and imagination and ultimately that lead to poetry that poetry is the exploration of this philosophical duality that there has to be imagination and there has to be negotiation with reality which will ultimately result in poetry Stevens's poetry imagination and reality there is an interchange between these two worlds migratory passings to and fro quickenings promethean liberations and discoveries reality should be mediated through the creative power of imagination and this is exactly what we were talking about the negotiation between imagination and reality which leads to uh, poetry supreme fiction Uh, is a phrase invented by uh, was invented by Wallace Stevens he invented the phrase supreme fiction in 1922 poetry is the supreme fiction madam a high tone this is there in high tone old christian woman but it was further explored in his notes towards a uh, supreme fiction published in 1942 stevens conceptualized poetry as an alternative to religion and what is this supreme fiction people replace belief in transcendent god with fiction if this means that the idea of god is an illusion stevens argues that there were both harmful illusions and benign illusions and the idea of god is an example of benign illusion Stevens shared Santayana's view that the god of religion is a product of the poetic imagination because the will to believe persists even after a particular object of belief loses its appeal and this is how the imagination invents a credible alternative uh, and you know Santayana and Stevens they were good friend and remained so uh, almost throughout their 
lives. And so the supreme fiction is the idea that even if there is no God, you need to invent a God to believe in something. And uh, well, in his political beliefs, uh, Stevens was a conservative, uh, a kind of Republican. Stevens also had no clear idea about the concrete form of supreme fiction. It was an abstract and variable idea. Cook could comment that, quote, how this might come about, he could not foretell, though he could imagine how. The desire for a supreme fiction is such a great need of the human spirit that sometimes it amounts to violence, a violence from within that protects us from a violence without. It's the imagination pressing back against the pressure of reality. So you can see the uh, one of the important um, issues in Stevens's poetry is this negotiation between imagination and reality and a tussle between imagination and reality as to their supremacy and probably what uh, finally Stevens decides that it is uh, imagination which negotiates with the reality and has probably the final word. Stevens's idea of romanticism Stevens's notion of a new romanticism or a new belief is to create a poem equivalent to the idea of God. He departs from the old romantics in his recognition of the idea that all belief is fictive, products of the imagination. But for the old romantics, the divine mind simply exists. The poet depicts it and by depicting it shares more fully in it. And this is exactly what I was trying to say when I said that um, uh, the imagination has to create fiction, uh, invent fictive God even if that is necessary and this God is as important as poetry or um, vice versa poetry is as important as this God. So in a way this supreme fiction which is poetry Stevens's work replaces God. Wallace Stevens and the figure of the woman. At a time when women were demanding their right and articulating it in personal, artistic, professional and political realms in the United States, it is crucial to interrogate Stevens's treatment of women characters in his poetic creation. Stevens presented women in reductive manner. In a high-toned old Christian woman, the widow is the object of mockery. In Sunday morning, the woman's feeble voice is overpowered by the male speaker and it is his logocentric voice which reveals the truth to the woman. She hears upon that water without sound a voice that cries, the tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering, it is the grave of Jesus where he lay. So you see uh, what happens in the Sunday morning, there is the, it's a Sunday morning and there is a woman uh, who did not go to the Sunday service and um, he was Relax, sorry, she was relaxing with a cup of coffee and uh, she was in her negligee. So, you see, there is a contrast between the, uh, the sensuous and the sensual world on the one hand and the spiritual world on the other. And you see, here is a, uh, here is the character of the woman, but the poetic persona is a very strong male voice who finally tells the woman the truth is that Jesus was a man who died and who was uh, laid to rest in the grave in Palestine. So, you see, uh, the, uh, the mystery associated with Christian faith that Jesus was the son of God is being contested in the poem. The woman in the emperor of ice cream is dead, cold, dumb and her feet protrude. Even in her last journey, flowers will come wrapped wrapped in last month's newspapers and most importantly the help of a muscular one becomes necessary for this woman's wake. In the idea of order at Key West, the female singer merely sings but it is the male speaker who derives philosophical truth out of it. More interestingly, the moment the speaker addresses a male friend, Roman Fernandez, tell me if you know, she evaporates. So you see, 
that is exactly the same thing happens in this poem in the uh, order of Key West. Exactly that is what happened in the Sunday morning. There is the woman character, but she is sidelined by a strong hegemonistic patriarchal voice who only knows the truth. So, the, uh, the woman becomes the occasion, but the truth is derived by the male speaker. The emperor of ice cream is in two stanzas, both comprising eight lines. The first stanza is spoken by what Helen Wendler calls an unknown master of ceremonies. This persona gives orders demanding that a muscular man who works in a cigar rolling factory whip up some concupiscent cards for the guests. He asks the wenches, um, which is a colloquialism for girls, uh, wear what they would normally wear implying that they didn't wear some dress meant for the rituals of mourning. He asks the boys to bring flowers wrapped in last month's newspapers. The stanza ends with the cryptic note, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. So you see in the first stanza, there is a trivialization of deaths. Somebody has died, but normally what happens in a wake, people are somber, People are uh, dressed in uh, in mourning black, and uh, there is some kind of uh, gravity centering the situation. But here, what happens? There lies the dead body. There are girls who come in um, in informal dress in the sense that they are not in their mourning black, and there are boys who bring flowers in last month's newspaper. So all around there is a trivialize, trivialization of death. The second stanza makes it clear that all this was a preparation for a funeral. As the poem takes us to the room where the solitary corpse of the dead woman is lying. This master of ceremonies continues to give commands, asking that a sheet on which the dead woman when alive embroidered fantails be taken from the dresser, which has three glass knobs missing from it, to cover the dead woman's face. If the woman's horny feet is not covered because of the sheet's short length, this doesn't matter as it reflects the coldness and silence of death. The lamb should affix its beam and shine fully on the woman without hiding away her dead body. The poem enigmatic, enigmatically ends with the refrain, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. So you see, um, there is a question uh, because as it is evident from the description that this woman belongs to, uh, to the working class, probably she was a prostitute and uh, is it because she did not belong to the upper class, to the sophisticated uh, to the uh, educated, sophisticated class, that is why her death is being trivialized or is it death in the, the very idea of death is being trivialized in this poem. The poem is antipoetic because it goes against the tradition of funeral poems in its instructions to the mourners and in tone. This is uh, what I was trying to say that they are is a tradition of mourning poems where the tone is som somber, but here the tone is rather frivolous and that is why it goes against the uh, tradition of mourning poems. The poem breaks the usual sentimentality of death, rather the poem celebrates the pleasure of survival with the pleasant taste of ice cream amidst the inevit inevitability of death. The corpse is cold and dumb, while ice cream, the symbol of pleasure as absolute good, is cold but concupiscent. The poet here advocates desire as the sustenance of life. Culbert and Violet look at the element of irony and satire in the poem. For them, Stevens criticizes the emperor who has no wisdom and his authority derives from the ignorance and purposelessness of his subjects. Their gods are dead and they have placed their futile lives into the hands of a monarch whose throne is as transient, unstable and negligible as the ice cream. So you see here is this, um, this trivialization continues. The I, emperor who is supposed to be a but to be the all-powerful man, um, dignified man and a powerful man is reduced to the emperor of ice cream because if you um, consider the image of ice cream, it is very short-lived, it melts, it only gives 
pleasure and it represents the sensuousness of life. But the emperor should have represented something more serious, something more somber, something more grave. There is the incongruity of the role given to the muscular man who rolls big cigars. Instead of a masculine job, he is assigned the trivial job of applying his strength to kitchen cups. Concupiscent curds that has the sensuous and lustful undertone indicates that the futile empire provides artificial stimulation to its physically deficient boys and wenches. The poem might also be a product of capitalist reign where mourning over a corpse becomes less significant than the consumption of ice cream. Another critic interprets the cigar as phallic symbol and as concupiscent connotes sexual desire uh, slash last and since there is the presence of cards the juxtaposition connotes sem the women in the poem are whores including even the dead woman they dwaddle before the boys wearing dress and the boys court them by bringing the flowers death and desire becomes intermingled in the poem and uh, I personally believe there is a strong criticism of capitalism in this poem because it privileges feeling, it privileges desire over uh, emotion and feeling uh, a desire which is um, materialistic and that is how capitalism in a way kills the finer human values in individuals. Illusion and reality. Helen Wendler would argue that the embroidered sheet as the symbol of art itself is too insufficient to cover the crude reality. The embroidery or art of Stevens's woman only goes to show how cold she is and dumb. So there is this, um, this uh, dichotomy between uh, art and um, art and reality and art is inadequate to um, explain reality or in a way to cover up reality and there the conflict runs through the, throughout the poem. The poem represents the duality between reality and appearance and uh, the, this, this dichotomy between reality and appearance is a recurrent thing in western thought. Let B be the finale of C. Seeming of art or illusion fails to supersede the being of life. For Stevens, poetry through its irrational distortion can transform the ordinary world into the fluent world. The Stevens's poem makes it possible to portray a pleasurable ice creamy world of sensation, but isn't this momentary sensation contrasts with the death with death which is nothing but an eternal exit from the material world? So you see there is this tension between reality and uh, and uh, illusion, there is this irrational distortion of life which cannot finally cover up the uh, the reality of being. So, it is the same which is the same and there is the reality which is not the same. Stevens's imaginative impulse confronts reality of death in the poem and the war goes on throughout the poem. The poem raises issues like whether art can be perfect because the dresser lacked three glass knobs whether art should be the mimesis of reality where it will show blatantly her horny feet protrude or art should cover up the imperfection of life and present it with pleasant metaphor of ice cream. Uh, I, I hope you are familiar with the term mimesis which means imitation and mimesis plays an important role in the critical thinking of classical antiquity where uh, art was uh, considered to be a mimesis of or the or imitation of uh, reality and here uh, Stevens kind of asks a question interrogates this idea whether art is actually a um, my mission of uh, life or whether art can actually um, uh, bled, cover up the imperfection of reality. So, if art is considered to be perfect and life uh, the real and reality is considered to be imperfect, how uh, far it is possible for art to cover up the imperfection of uh, real life. 
whether poetry could reveal the truth that is the crude reality of death or it could only employ the mask of fictiveness to evade that reality, whether poetry could be the supreme fiction replacing the god who caused the woman's death or in other terms poetry could replace the emperor of ice cream who believed in the vigor of life more than the coldness of death. So, you see this, this tension between life and death, uh, art and reality continues throughout the poem. Like his famous poem Sunday morning, uh, a high-toned old Christian woman is also considered as the anti-mythological poem in its debunking of traditional Christianity. But whereas Sunday morning is meditative, philosophical and carries religious undertone, this poem is more challenging and anti-religious in articulation. The former poem embraces the lot of mortal man where death is the mother of beauty, the latter parades a bodiness unpurged by epitaph. The old Christian widow in this poem represents the moral law. This law is in clash with the opposing law free from puritanical restraint. This debate continues culminating in the playful repudiation of the uh, omen. The poem is constructed around a series of contrasting metonymies. Uh, the old omen uh, corresponds to moral law which is the nave of church, palms, citherns, haunted heaven and the opposite set of metonymies are opposing laws, pre-style, mask, saxophones. There is imagery of architecture in the poem. Imagery of architecture, Christian nave is compared with the pagan peristyle. Freestanding columns of Hellenic Greece is pitted against the enclosed nave. In place of Christian Puritanism, the reader is relocated in a period without parallel in its artistic, athletic and political acts of human achievement. There are uh, imagery of religious rituals as well. The mask. Though mask was the spectacle of music and costuming performed during Elizabethan and Jacobian age, it has its precedence in ancient pagan ceremonies which celebrated the passage of the seasons. Again, a binary is established between mask as pagan counterpart and religiosity of the mass performed in the church. Reversing the religious order, the nave reaches out towards haunted heaven while the mask becomes cosmic in its reaching out beyond the planets. There are imagery of music also. The conversion into palms by the old woman is like windy citherns hankering for hymns. The speaker's own conversion is also to the accompaniment of musical sounds, hair squiggling like saxophone. The soft and cold sound of the cithern is overpowered by the boisterous and lively sound of the saxophones. The theme of bodiness. The final section of the poem explores this theme of bodiness in a celebratory and carnivalous manner. As both the paths lead towards death and converted into palms, Stephen advocates for celebration in the earthly life. Stephen asks the disaffected flagellants, the images of the fervent believers sweeping themselves to intensify their religious fervor, to join in a jovial hulabalu among the spheres. The spiritual self-abnegation and the cost of hurting oneself to attain the divine favor is countered with playful hula balu. This is nothing but a kind of ribald mask, a carnival, a release, a pleasure principle. So you can clearly see that the poem is um, anti-Christian. Uh, all the Christian values are being debanked and uh, the pagan values are uh, being highlighted. So. Um, instead of indulging in self-flagellation, these people who uh, are supposed to be devout Christians should indulge in um, these carnivalesque uh, activities and uh, thereby release into a um, pleasure principle. Poetry is the supreme fiction, madam. 
George S. Lansing would claim that this is not so a poem of theological repudiation, rather this is a poem about poetics and dramatization of the role of fictive things in the creation of poetry. And it has all, uh, it has uh, been argued by critics that uh, this high toned old Christian woman is actually a, a poem about poetic creation, uh, the way um, Cold Ridges, uh, Kubla Khan is a poem about poetic creation, the way um, Ted Hughes Thought Fox is a poem about poetic creation. So, this supreme uh, fiction is not necessarily a repudiation of Christian theological ideas, it is more importantly engaged with what, uh, what poetry is and how these 50 things are important in the, uh, in the creation of poetry. Supreme fiction is the opposing law of the poem's speaker, therefore fiction and unrestrained bodiness seem to be equated. Poetry is a fiction which supersedes the fiction of Christianity. There is then a similarity between the fictionality of poetry and fictionality of religion and Stevens argues elsewhere that both the religion and poetry relies on the imagination and it is the imagination which grapples with reality and creates fiction. So, we are coming back to the same argument that it is imagination which negotiates uh, reality and then uh, this negotiation results into poetry which is a kind of supreme fiction. Art is more powerful medium than religion. Interestingly, the hymns and epitaphs of Christianity are insufficient in comparison with the poem's Jovial Hulabalu. Jovial Hulabalu symbolizes vitality of life and it is the poetry, the supreme fiction that can only create and sustain this pleasurable fictive world. It is poetry and art and fiction that creates, exposes and finally overpowers the fictiveness of religion. Taking this line into consideration, but fictive things wink as they will, Lensing comments that wink is not here targeted merely at the wincing window, but also this is a reference where fiction, imagination, poetry winks at reality. The poem is in a way metafictional in nature, which directs attention to itself as a poem about fictionality and this is what I was trying to talk about when I uh, mentioned the poems, uh, one by Coleridge, the other by Ted Hughes, that it is a poem about the, about writing uh, poetry, about the creative processes and in that sense it is metafictional because this poem directs its gaze unto itself and uh, tries to explore the um, uh, fictionality of the poem. Critics also look at modernist sensibility in Stephen's poem with the phrase like squiggling like saxophones, muzzy bellies in parrot and tink and tank and tongue ka tung tung which actually represent the godless and confused world of modernism. Stevenson's poetry talks about art's desperate attempt to grapple with the outer reality of the world through the magical world of imagination, through the charm of fictionality. In the end, poetry is the supreme fiction and we willingly believe in that fictionality to negotiate with the mundane reality. Even amidst art's imperfectibility, it is fictionality of art that conquer forces like death and religion. And um, in a way, Stevens is coming back to the central idea that though poetry is a supreme fiction, poetry is the most important and probably the only only weapon available, made available to mankind when it comes to um, negotiating forces like death and religion. Thank you.